Let's welcome Dara. This is a lapel mic. I should put on my lapel. Okay, how about that? Is that okay? Can everyone in the back hear me? Yes? Okay. Uh, so the language that we've been developing at IOHK is called Plutus. Um, and so I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about the language and show you a live demo of it. Uh, that'll be fun. Um, uh, I won't be showing you too much about the language itself. I'll be uh, trying to give you a, a higher level overview of what's going on with the language and the motivations behind it. Um, so what is Plutus? Well, as a language, Plutus is a purely functional language. It has strong static types. And uh, very different from many languages, it has a formal specification. Um, even languages like Haskell, which uh, is arguably the most widely used of the purely functional and strong statically typed languages, lacks a formal specification. Uh, and so this sort of sets Plutus apart. Uh, so let's see, what does it mean for a language to be purely functional? Well, what that means is there are no side effects. In particular, there is no state or mutation. And there is no implicit failures. Um, and so this is important for a smart contract language because it helps you reason about what the programs are going to do. Uh, most languages that have state mutation make it very difficult to reason about them because you have to track what values are in what variables. You have to track uh, all sorts of hidden properties of the system. And by having no state or mutation, it makes it much easier to understand what's going on in the, programming, like in the program. Uh, and also by lacking implicit failures, um, it means that you know exactly what the program is, what parts of the program are running at any given time. Uh, there are no throw statements, no catch statements, nothing like this. And so you know when you look at a part of a program that Assuming everything has uh, uh, run to that point in the language, you haven't gone anywhere else sort of mysteriously by throwing. Um, and so it's, again, much easier to reason about. And what does it mean for Plutus to have strong static types? Well, it means that everything has a type, uh, literally everything. Uh, there's no uh, sort of mysterious, untyped stuff. Um, it means that all types are explicit. Uh, so when you declare a new function or a new value or anything like this, you have to say what its type is. You don't get to assume that the language will figure it out for you because if we rely on the language to figure it out, it might not be what you mean. Uh, in particular, we have uh, user-defined algebraic data. Rather than just uh, arrays and strings, we have a rich type system. So you can define what you want. Uh, it's similar to Haskell and ML and languages like this. And uh, in particular, we also have explicit effects in your types. So if you do want side effects, that's OK. You can have them. But they have to be explicit in your types. And you have to handle them uh, similar to the way that Haskell would handle effects. Uh, this is unlike a language like ML, which uh, claims to be purely functional, but has implicit effects. Uh, and so it's much harder to reason about. By having uh, a rich type system, you can express what you want to express clearly. And by having explicit types, including explicit effect types, it means that you know when a function claims to return an integer, it's going to return an int integer. It's not going to return, uh, it's not going to throw an error or something like this. Uh, and if something says that it might throw an error, well, you know right up front that it might throw an error. Uh, and so what does it mean now for uh, Plutus to have a formal specification? Well, we have a type theory. 
uh, an honest-to-goodness type theory, not just uh, a tutorial that says, here's how you sort of figure out what the types of your programs are. It's an actual type theory. Uh, we have a very simple core language called Plutus Core. And the reason we have that is uh, it might make sense in the future for people to define custom languages on top of it. And as long as those languages uh, can, or features, or any extensions to Plutus can compile down to the core language, then it means that you haven't really gotten much more out of the language than what was ori originally there. Right? And all your reasoning and your proofs still run because the core language hasn't changed. Uh, we also have a big step semantics and a stack machine semantics. Uh, both of these are very important for proving properties about your language, and so we have those. Um, so now I want to show you, oh, uh, lastly, um, and I didn't mention this earlier, this is kind of a, an extension of the previous slide. Um, why do we have these features? Well, because we want to do contract verification. Um, we want to be able to write smart contracts and know that they're going to do what we think they're going to do. Right? That they express the intentions of the authors of the contract and implement those correctly. And so the way that we can do this, there, well, there are many options, but one option is a richer type system. So as I mentioned, uh, we can build fancier languages on top of Plutus Core and uh, that have much uh, more complicated type systems, for instance, dependent types or refinement types or session types or anything you like. And as long as it can compile down to the core, everything is fine. But we could also use more powerful systems such as Agda, Koch, and Isabel and uh, get the full power of proof assistance to construct very complex proofs. And none of those would really be possible if we didn't have a simple uh, language that was easy to reason about. Um, they, would, they would be possible, but it would be very, very hard, and you probably wouldn't want to do any of it. Uh, so OK, I'm going to show you real quick a little Plutus demo. And you can actually go to this. Sorry we don't have like tryplutus.com soon. Uh, but you can go to here, go to this IP address, and uh, what you will find is this. And so I'm just going to show you a little, little bit about this stuff. Um, okay, so I guess I can show a bunch of things. OK, this is, I guess, wide enough. So as I mentioned, Plutus has user-definable algebraic data types. And so for example, uh, if you wanted to define the type of Booleans, you could say we have a new data type, Boolean, and there are two possible values, true and false. And if we want to now define a simple logical function such as not, we would say, OK, well, not is a function that takes a Boolean and gives you back a Boolean. And here's how it behaves. When you apply not to true, you get back false. And when you apply not to false, you get back true. Right? And just to prove that this is actually running uh, and works, <laughs> cross your fingers. Uh, huh, thank goodness. Um, so what's <laughs> What's going on here is that uh, the declarations and the term that I type in here, those are being sent to the server. They're being type checked. And then uh, this expression here is being sent back from the server. You'll notice this is not uh, a, a computed term. This is just an internal representation. And uh, there's a, a, um, a CK machine running in JavaScript on this page. If you want to see my uh, awful JavaScript code, you can I open up the source and check it out. And it's actually running this code in the browser. So this language, in some sense, compiles to JavaScript. Um, and uh, it does seem to do what you expect it to do. Uh, so just as another example of user defined data types, let's consider the type of lists. And you'll notice that this is, uh, these are lists of type A. It's not just a, a, a black box list. As I mentioned, everything has a type, and you have to say what its type is. Um, so well, let me refresh this to clean that up. Um, so a list of A's can consist of either nothing, nil, or we can construct a list consisting of an A and another list of A's. Uh, so for instance, that's a list. Uh, it's a very simple list, and um, 
some of you might be familiar with uh, cons lists in Scheme or Lisp dialects. That's exactly what this is. It's a singly linked list. Uh, and so now we also have this function map, which says if you give me, for any choice of A and B, if you give me a function from A's to B's, I will give you a function from lists of A to lists of B. And all it does is applies the function f to every element in the list. And so for instance, if I mapped the function lambda x, x plus 2 over that list we just had before, we should get back, oh, <laughs> uh, we get back me not typing things correctly. Let's see, what did I, you can tell that this is actually doing fancy things. It's not just a pre-scripted demo. Um, what did I, uh, oh, too many, no, oh, oh, no, I know what I did. That's right, I haven't implemented uh, infix operators yet. <laughs> in, in, parsing infix operators is really hard. You'd think it's simple, but when you use uh, certain, certain uh, parsing libraries, it's not so easy. Um, okay, there we go. So when we, uh, when we map this function, lambda x, x goes to x plus two, we get back the list uh, uh, three, four, five, which is exactly what happens when you apply that function to the list one, two, three. Um, so you have a full programming language with uh, <laughs> higher order polymorphism in this case, but we can add richer types. Um, and uh, you can define your own types. You can do, as you can see uh, here and also here, you can do pattern matching definitions. It's very similar to Haskell if any of you have programmed in Haskell. Uh, if you haven't, I highly suggest you give it a try. Um, and I think it's considerably easier to understand what's going on in a language like this. So lastly, I just want to take a look at the, uh, the simple script that uh, Dionysus showed. Uh, so uh, for the script that sends just some coin from one person to another, uh, namely the uh, pay to public key hash script. Uh, the way that this would run, now I have to say this will not actually run if you try to run this. This will give you an error because we uh, don't have crypto stuff in the browser. We don't want you relying on anything in the browser to do crypto stuff right now. Um, so if you run this, you'll get an error. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is we'll define what it means, what, what kind of information you need to uh, prove to me that you are authorized to use this coin. And in this particular case, it's just P2 PKH, pay to public key hash. And the information you need is just two byte strings, right? The, the public key and the signature. And now, let me make this a bit bigger so you can see. Uh, what does it mean for such information to be valid for a transaction? Well, we just have to check two things. I'm gonna walk down here because I'm wireless. Um, we just need to check two things, right? We just need to check that the hash of the public key is equal to whatever that nasty number is, right, that we were, that we're expecting the person we're sending it to. But we also have to check that uh, the public key is in fact used to sign this transaction that we sent to right? That's all we have to do, just check those two things. And I think this is a lot easier to understand than the fourth like mess that you get in Bitcoin. Um, and so the last thing is, this is just what a validator looks like. So this part here is what someone actually sends, right, on, my out, on the output of a transaction. I just give you this, and I say that to validate some info, well, we get the hash of the transaction, and then we just check that it's okay. And if it is, if it's, if it's okay and it returns true, then we're a success, it's fine. And if it's false, then we fail, okay? And the, uh, the comp type here, by the way, is the thing that actually tells you this is going to be running in a transaction computation. And so when this fails, it really fails. Your transaction fails, right? That's like a side effect. And so it's right there in the types. It causes your transaction to actually fail. And then lastly, you know, what does a redeemer have to produce in order to show that they're authorized? Well, they just have to produce their public key and their signature. So that's a, an overview of Plutus. Um, any questions? Yes? Um, what what um, networks do you anticipate this code being used within? So built into the Ethereum contracts, the Ethereum Classic contracts, the other functioning networks? Uh, 
so the question was, uh, what networks do we expect this to run on? Um, so we have uh, considered having uh, compilers for many different languages, um, including the uh, Ethereum virtual machine, including WebAssembly, um, basically anything, the idea is that anything you want to run it on, as long as you can produce a compiler that you can show is correct, then you should, be feel, you should feel free to run it on that. So if you want to run it on Ethereum, that's cool. If you can figure out some way to compile it to Bitcoin, and you want to run it on Bitcoin, that's cool. Um, uh, the one thing that we think is really important, though, is that you can demonstrate to anyone who's relying on your compiler that your compiler is, in fact, correct. Um, there's no, there's no like enforceable obligation to do that. If only we could put that into a blockchain and say, you, you're not allowed to write a, a compiler for this unless you can prove it's correct. That would be nice. Uh, but it, it's good to be able to prove to your, your users or whoever that uh, when you compile Plutus, you're actually doing what you think you do. So the question was, uh, what were the challenges when designing this, uh, in particular, as a smart contract language? And I think that uh, um, I think that um, actually, because this is a smart contract language, uh, it's easier to design it in a way, because that puts certain constraints on uh, what qualifies as a language that's easy to reason about. Um, once you, once, once you can say, I need to be able to produce formal proofs in an actual uh, proof assistant, uh, that rules out a large class of languages. Typical languages like, you know, if you wanted to write something in JavaScript, for instance, which is incredibly familiar to a lot of people, um, that just, that's just not an acceptable language uh, if you want to do formal verification of anything. And so, I would say actually that it was less challenging than designing a normal language simply because of those constraints. It narrows down the options significantly. I just wanted to add uh, a brief thing to it. There's a, a great computer scientist named Yuichi Harai who works with the Ethereum Foundation and he's kind of their formal verification guy. And so uh, Yuichi has been systematically looking at a couple of different things, but some of his publications stem around formal verifications of different Ethereum smart contracts. <laughs> and uh, they're enormous pieces of work, like 60, 70 pages uh, long. And that just stems from the fact that they're doing things in solidity and how the EVM is designed. So one of the goals of the Plutus project was to say that you know, how can we build something that's easier to verify and validate, and in some cases, uh, permit some automation behind that process. Um, you know, the other thing is that we're probably going to live in a multi-language world where you have languages that capture intent. Uh, you have languages that are being used by kind of full-stack web dev type people that are probably going to look like imperative languages in that respect. And then you're going to have languages which are necessarily for high assurance code. And so you shouldn't try to construct a one-size-fits-all solution and say, oh, this covers everything because the lawyer is not going to use the same methodology as this computer scientist. Rather, you should say, okay, something like this is probably going to be used for library work or for things like the DAO, where you have a lot of money at stake and you don't necessarily have a reset switch if you make a mistake. So that was one of the design goals of Plutus. Um, one other brief statement. Hi, everybody. I'm Charles Hoskins, and I, I CEO of IOHK. Uh, I'll be on the panel later. Uh, one, one of the other design goals of Plutus was to, to say, what can we take from the functional programming world and bring it into the smart contract world? Uh, there's been a couple of projects like Dex and Pack, which have brought Lisp, uh, but nothing like Haskell has quite been brought into the smart contract world quite yet. Uh, most of the languages that I'm aware of are imperative in nature, like Solidity and Surface and so forth. So this is really the first one. So we're going to build compilers to get it into the EVM so it can be used in both Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Um, 
Do you want to say a bit about pay semantics? Ah, yes. So we've been talking with uh, Grigory Roshu at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, he's put together a phenomenal toolkit called uh, K, which lets you specify these, the syntax, the semantics, both the, the static semantics in the type theory and also the dynamic semantics uh, of how things compute for programming languages. And um, he's got a ver uh, like a, quite a large variety of formal semantics for uh, languages. So he has JavaScript, uh, I think possibly Java. Is there? There's Java, there's C. And these are like really, really tough languages to, to formalize. And they've got this. And so we're going to be building a formal specification of Plutus in K that will give you machine checkable correctness of this. <laughs> right? So it won't, it won't just be, you know, oh, read the paper and hope that actually the, the code that I wrote in Haskell uh, implements the paper. Um, you know, ho hopefully it's obvious that it does, but if it's not, you can also go look at the K uh, formalization, which we'll have in a little bit, uh, that will let you be confident that actually it does. Um, and I believe that uh, sometime in the near future, they will be working on a formal semantics for Haskell. And so that will be very interesting, and you'll, you'll have a full uh, translation from Plutus into the Haskell code, so you can check that the Haskell stuff actually implements it correctly and, and be confident that the our code uh, is correct. So, Gunnar, um, let me a little bit broader your question. So, keeping in line with the interdisciplinary nature of the great workshop, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that in our audience we have people both from computer science and other stuff. How, so the way that you presented like your um, um, ideas about proofs, like the, the, the engagement with the computer science community in mm -hmm. various ways, um, but I, I do understand and expect that this is just the first step yes. towards providing um, an offering for a way to write smart contracts mm -hmm. that we, I would assume that the hope is that a much wider community of people and in fact, uh, uh, legal scientists and practicing lawyers will be able to engage with that. So, would you be able to share with us some of that, uh, some of that vision, uh, potentially as uh, uh, next steps for, from your presentation and so on? Yeah. So, what we've been working on uh, alongside Plutus is uh, what we call a smart contract ontology. Basically, just to get uh, an overview of what the, uh, the the fundamental parts are of smart contracts and uh, what's, uh, which aspects are necessary for reasoning about them to ensure properties that you expect. Uh, so for instance, in let's say a, a game of, a, a smart contract based game of uh, rock, paper, and scissor, you wanna make sure that uh, when both players have chosen their hand in the game and one of them has revealed it, that the other player in the game also reveals their hand to guarantee that they don't cheat and they keep the money uh, that they committed to the game. Um, these are these are important properties, right? To, to prove that people um, fulfill obligations that they had as uh, as part of the contract. And so the ontology is the first step towards uh, making clear what those what the vocabulary, so to speak, of smart contracts should be. And then from there we'll be exploring what the right tools are for uh, letting people state the properties, and then hopefully. Uh, hopefully automatically prove that their programs have those properties. And if we're really, really lucky, how to extract programs from those properties automatically so that you don't actually have to write any of this. Uh, the ideal case is you just, you just state the behavior of the smart contract at a high level, and then you can extract what the implementation should be from that. That's a, a bit of a longer term goal, but uh, if we take advantage of the techniques that exist, in academia, that should be possible. Um, now, that does mean that probably someone's gonna have to write some formal logic somewhere. Uh, if you've got tens of millions of dollars on the line, I think that's a, a reasonable expectation. Um, and uh, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that lawyers could uh, construct and maybe do some formal proofs. Uh, that seems like something that uh, might need to be done more often. Uh, any other questions? 
So just in order to clarify this so I understand this correctly, that the vision would be that the uh, obviously the natural language would map to uh, a language like the one that you presented. Is that is mm -hmm. that something that you can see? I would not recommend trying to map natural language into programs, uh, at least programs where money is on the line, uh, just because natural language is rather ambiguous and uh, vague, and there are uh, many difficulties in doing that. Um, natural language has so much that's open for interpretation that you don't want to make that. There's a reason that legalese exists as a convention Right? And it's because speaking to people as people normally speak is not very good for communicating intent. Um, and legalese is in some sense a formal logic, but there's still this, you know, this, this natural language problem there. And so if you could push people towards actual formal logic, uh, that's even better. Um, so I guess the goal for the future is to discover that, that language that actually is accessible. Yes. To yeah. wider audience at the same time, form of the yeah. and not to something that the computer has. Yeah. Or maybe you'll just have like an intern do all the <laughs> translation. <laughs> uh. Yes. No questions for the audience. Yavis? Thank you. So I didn't see what you did for loops or recursion. So you have recursion, or do you allow loops? And what do you mean in terms of QL or target mm -hmm. for anything repetitive? Uh, yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. what guarantees termination? Mm -hmm. What's your cost measure? Do you have constructs in the language? And generally, do you support both loops and recursion, or one? And which one is one? Uh, so we support uh, recursion. Um, no restrictions on what kind of recursion. Um, the only real restriction is that you get a fixed limit in the number of computational steps. Um, and that's, that's just it. You, you, if you run over that limit, that's too bad. Um, we're going to provide tools, of course, so that you can verify that your smart contracts will run. But uh, you, know, you don't get to loop forever or anything like this. You terminate after you know, 10,000 steps or whatever number turns out to be sort of optimal. Um, in terms of like efficiency and stuff, uh, because this is a functional language, we can do things like tail call optimization. So if you want to do loops, it, you, can, you can do loops via tail call recursion. Um, regarding cost, there is nothing like gas in Ethereum. There is something kind of like gas. We call it petrol, um, which, uh, which is basically free in this case. Um, whether or not we should be assigning costs to particular operations is not clear. Um, a lot of bugs in Ethereum come about from the fact that you're paying for gas for things, but then when you have failures, weird things happen, and all sorts of bizarre behavior happen because of that. Uh, so in Plutus, gas is free, uh, but you only get so much of it. You don't get to keep going. Ah, so how, how could we handle uh, how can we handle storage and mutable state? Um, so within a particular script, uh, it's perfectly possible to do uh, Haskell style state. Uh, you'll have uh, some type that makes it look like you're writing a, a stateful program, but actually secretly it's not stateful. Um, for persistent storage across many many transactions, uh, there are a number of options that we're investigating. Uh, one possibility there is to just say, well, in fact, the smart contract is a state in the Haskell sense. Right? It's a function from some state value to another state and some output. And that, pers and that function and the current state will then persist and mutate across multiple transactions. Uh, finding the right model for this is, uh, is not obvious because you want to be able to reason about it. And also, you want to sort of you want to make sure that you don't run into strange situations like you get in Ethereum where things are interacting, but you can't tell who's interacting with what. 
who's returning from where. Um, so finding the right model for m a cross transaction state is uh, an ongoing uh, research project.